John Papa Giorgio of Papa's Basement here. I know we typically do a comedy talk format for the show, but I had a great guest on, Mike Sachs, author of Poking a Dead Frog, Conversations with Today's Top Comedy Writers. The dude was funny as hell. He couldn't have been nicer. And the interview ran about an hour, so I figured, what the hell, we are just going to make that the whole show. For those of you out there who consider themselves students of comedy, Mike's book is amazing. The guy really talks with some of the best that have ever put a pen to paper. James L. Brooks, Mel Brooks, Adam McKay, Paul F. Tompkins, Bill Hader, Bruce Valanche, for God's sake. The dude got some people for this. If you are into the thought of ever breaking into comedy yourself, I also can't recommend the book highly enough for that. It reads like a how-to manual for doing exactly that. It is now time to bring on author of great renown, Mike Sachs. The man has written for Vanity Fair, Esquire, GQ, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Post, uh, Vice, Maxim, and uh, Mike, uh, Women's Health. I have to ask about that. Yeah, that was about my erectile dysfunction <laughs> that I used to suffer at summer camp at Camp Erie in Maryland. No, that that was about. And I forget what that was about, but I thought I would get a female perspective in there because there's such there's so few in my resume that I thought I would uh, put that into impress. I like it, <laughs> dabbing the tears of disappointment. <laughs> not for me, you're not. <laughs> uh, Mike has also cranked out a lot of books and good books, not e-books, real books. You've got and here's the kicker: conversations with 21 humor writers about their craft, your wildest dreams within reason. And the book that I managed to snag a copy of and that I've been kind of stuck to ever since, Poking a Dead Frog, Conversations with Today's Top Comedy Writers. And, Mike, I just want to thank you before we begin for coming on the show. I don't know if it's fr because you're from the area or you have the Greek wife. I, I'm just going to exploit the hell out of whatever it is you see here. No, the, you know what it is, really, is is anyone from Northern Virginia or D.C., that's a comedy fan I love because when I was growing up, I felt kind of alone. Um, all my friends weren't really into what I was watching. It was all based out of New York and L.A. And uh, to grow up as a comedy fan in D.C. Uh, was was kind of interesting. So anyone who's a huge fan uh, from anywhere, but especially from D.C., it always intrigues me. Well, uh, I have to – what age are you exactly? I want to know if we kind of came up at the same time. Or... No, I'm 45. 45, okay. So do you have any memories whatsoever of Don and Mike in the area? I love Don and Mike. In fact, I was just on Rob Spiewak's um, podcast. <laughs> you have no idea how yeah. happy you have made me. I was, well, no, uh... I, I'm a huge fan of Don and Mike. And actually, there are some people – I forget who it was. They got into the business. They, they're successful now, and they – were on Don and Mike, and they were fans of Don and Mike, but for some reason they turned their back on Don and Mike, which I don't understand. Maybe it's because it was a D.C. thing, even though they were syndicated. But, no, I'm huge fans of theirs. I thought they were amazing. Okay, good. I, I grew up obsessed with them, and I think that was maybe the first time I realized I was like a slavish devotee of comedy, if it was in the right form. I think they're one of the best things that that area has produced. I mean, consistently great, and it sort of imploded towards the end for various reasons, I guess. But that um, chemistry was amazing. But also, the podcasts that are being done now um, are still fantastic. I mean, there's daily podcasts. There's a ton of stuff that you, can, you should check out. Uh, it's still great. So it's not as if we should talk in the past tense. They're doing great stuff still, which I listen to. Really? The, uh, the new, well, I guess it's not on Realm anymore, but the new Don and Mike show, or Don show. Well, no, yeah, no, it's the, um, yeah, the Don Geronimo, uh, uh, is gone, but it's the Michael O'Mara show that's, uh, that's on the, uh, he has his own syndicate now, a syndicated, uh, podcast. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, both of those guys are just amazing, and, uh, I, I just, I kind of miss driving around listening to those guys. Oh, it, talk does not exist like that on air, period, anymore. I I could do no. a twenty minute segment on that how it was all doomed by Janet Jackson pulling out her breast and the FCC fines increasing and yeah I don't know what happened I mean they that used to be a full schedule they used to have an amazing schedule the sports junkies and then they had at one point G Gordon Liddy I don't know if you were listening to it at that time which oh, was God, insane yes. but I loved the guy he was really likable he was and uh, then of course Don and Mike so that was like a full day and this is pre podcast obviously. But um, don't forget listening. the grease man, sir. Do not forget Ooh, the grease man. Oh, Doug Track, the grease. <laughs> How about you? Oh, double to do. 
Yeah, I never really got into the Grease Man. <laughs> Me neither, just... but uh, I can always... I, I love impressions of him. Yeah, and um, how he got into some trouble always kind of disturbed me what he was um it was always the same thing that got him in trouble too is he I know, always that, took a, a certain path that's what bothered me i mean it was so specific it was it was very uncalled for jokes about racism that were just horrible and they were very consistently racist yeah i i pictured a lot of doodles in the margin of every paper he had yeah i, I would hate to see those yeah. hangman nooses that were in the margins of that. But what was strange, too, was that it was always on time delay. So, like, it wasn't as if he knew he messed up. It was it was only later, like, he would receive, you know, all these calls, like, what? What did I do? What did I say about Martin Luther King? Yeah, F you, sir. Oh, squib the do <laughs> I could do an interview of nothing but Grease impressions with you, but uh, I don't know if that would well, go Well, wasn't well. he at, didn't he, uh, he left DC 101, or he was fired, I guess, and he went to 94.7, was it? And then he was on, wasn't he broadcasting from his basement in Potomac from one point for AM radio? My my claim to fame, when I initially started my very, very mediocre radio career, my first station was a pay-to-play station, and Grease Man had been reduced to recording at home and then showing up at our studio with tapes to get played. Oh, well, why did he need that for? That's what I don't understand. The guy made a lot of money, had a house in Potomac. Why did he need to... Go around, you know, it's the equivalent of selling cassettes out of your trunk. I mean, like, what what does he need at that point to be on the air so badly? I have no idea. I, It's weird. I'm like you. I didn't care for him, and yet so many people in the industry that I respect the hell out of really view him as a sound broadcaster fundamentally. They all crapped all over him mm -hmm. on air, and yet Stern, Don and Mike, I even want to say Opie and Anthony, after the fact, if they're interviewed about Grease Man, they will all doff their cap to the man. Yeah, they never doffed it while they were competing. Oh, God, no. Oh, God, no. But, you know, I remember driving to work. I used to work at Kent Mill Records and other places oh, in the area. Oh, God, you are going deep, dude. Oh, yeah. I love I worked it. there for 10 years in various places, Aspen Hill, Wheaton, Gaithersburg. But, you know, I, I would drive to work, especially in the summer when the windows were open. I would always see... Especially blue collar um, trucks and stuff, people mm -hmm. going to do painting jobs or whatever. Uh, they're always blasting Grease Man. That was hugely popular. And that's one of the things I miss now about satellite radio is that you don't really hear the same stuff being played. It's, it's a different, different noise from each car. But there used to be some sort of community, especially with Don and Mike, that I felt that you know, as I was driving around, there was a ton of other people driving around listening to the same program. I, I remember laughing out loud, listening to the show, and turning around in traffic and seeing one other person or so laughing, and I assumed it was also from the Don and Mike show. I, I feel that's happened to every form of art conceivable. Like, there's no show, really, anymore, like a Seinfeld. I don't want to use the term water cooler, but you know what I mean? Like, there's very little that people, the next day, they're at work, they're talking about it. Oh, yes, yeah, so everything is fragmented, and yeah. it's good because at any time of day, you can find what you want to re-listen to and watch, any time of day. Where in, in before, you know, I would have to watch reruns of Mama's Family just to watch something on TV. But now Please you don't watch... knock that. Please don't no, knock that. No, well, I won't. I will, but not on air. Um, I, but now there is a loss of community, I think. I mean, you can see anything you want or hear, listen to anything, but there's no sense of... Uh, everyone is also listening. So, like, the excitement of it is gone. Um, and uh, it's just become very, very personalized. No, absolutely. There's so much of it I think you can see on Twitter when people are screaming, you know, don't spoil it for me. And you want to think, well, one, just stay the hell off Twitter. But, two, if you were watching this live, you know, I'm, I'm not the custodian of your DVR <laughs> right. habits here. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like whenever you do anything that upsets someone, it's now your fault, even though you're not in any way... Like I, I've done that. I've talked about episodes on Twitter and stuff, and not like two minutes after the show, but weeks. And I'll get um, you know angry emails about why did I give it away? It's like I'm not your daddy. If I want to talk about the twist in Mad Men or whatever, like how long do I have to wait to be able to do that? No, I, I'm with you. I I think a great example right now. Apparently, I've heard there's a lot of twists to Gone Girl, and you know what? I'm just waiting till it's on HBO. I realize I'm playing with fire there. But so be it. I'm an adult. Well, by the time it's on HBO, it'll be out for a year, right? So like, Oh, absolutely. Like, I, I pretty much know whatever's spoilable in that will be spoiled. 
Actually, I do know the twist because I read the book, but I won't give it away. <laughs> Damn you, you literate bastard. The, the book is amazing. If I highly suggest you read the book, maybe even before you see the movie. I have, I've heard nothing but great things about oh, it. Oh, so. it's fantastic. Yeah. Eh, fine. Maybe I will stoop to that level. I have to ask, you got some names for this book. Uh, there, There's a bunch of guys, and I'm not going to act like I know everyone you got, because you truly are some sort of comedic historian. It's insane. No, that's not. I don't know everyone I got, but go on. <laughs> well, there's a guy by the name of Henry Beard, the founder of National Lampoon, I believe. Yes, co-founder, right. You make him sound harder to get a hold of than Ted Kaczynski, and yet this guy is cutting an interview with you like it's no thing. Uh, you have oh, Amy no. Poehler, Stephen yeah. Merchant, uh, a young up and comer by the name of Mel Brooks. Maybe you've heard right. of him. Right. How did you get these guys? Like, in all seriousness. <laughs> well, I, I have to be honest. A lot, it's very difficult to get all these guys. And I, I may, it may appear to be easy, but it's not. So sometimes a year's work goes into it. And um, also, I work at Vanity Fair magazine in New York, so that helps. That that name, everyone knows Vanity Fair. Very few people know my name. So, But with the name Vanity Fair, mm-hmm. I think they, they can um, trust that I'm not going to screw them or I'm not out to get them in, in any way. And also what I do is I also make it clear that I will send them back the interview for their final sign-off, that if they're uncomfortable, if they said anything that they don't want published, they can take it out. I, I just I don't care about that. And very rarely do they, but it, it makes them more comfortable and it, it allows uh, them to open up actually even more than they would otherwise. They don't feel constrained. Um, so, but when you're talking about Henry Beard, he hasn't been interviewed, I don't think, ever at length. And it was just luck of timing because he has he had a new book out, which was really great about two years ago. And I was interviewing, I asked to interview him about that, and he said yes, which I was surprised about. And then the interview went really well. So then I asked him if we could extend it and put it in the book, and he said yes. But it was just a matter of him finally being able to want to talk about National Lampoon because it was such a uh, diffi- not difficult, but it was a very um, intense time for him. And Absolutely. He was- and I, I don't want to interrupt, but I really didn't know the name. I believe it's Doug Kenny. Oh, Doug Kenny. Yeah, yeah his partner that passed under very suspicious or at least depressing circumstances. Right. Well, let me explain. Doug Kenny, for those who don't know him, was an extremely talented Harvard Lampoon writer in the late 60s, he wrote uh, the, the first um, popular magazine parody of uh, Playboy, and they got um, the permission from Playboy to do it. Then they wrote a parody of Lord of the Rings called Board of the Rings, and at that point he uh, started with Henry Beard and some others, a uh, national lampoon, which became absolutely huge, and then from there he went and uh, co-wrote Animal House, he wrote Caddyshack, and he was um, known within the industry as just being a genius. You know, everyone loved. He was a comedy writer's comedy writer. He did die in mysterious circumstances in Hawaii. They don't know if he killed himself, he fell off a cliff, or if it was a drug deal gone bad. The vast majority feel that it was suicide. But what happened was in 1980, there was an article in Esquire magazine, Doug Kenny was on the cover. If, if you can imagine a comedy writing being on the cover of Esquire these days, he <laughs> was on the cover. No, and this is an infamous article because what it did was it pissed off so many people who were quoted. The journalists got so many quotes incorrect or just plain made them up, allegedly, that um, it really turned off a lot of comedy writers to talk about National Lampoon for years and years. So, that, but at this point, it's 25 years. Um, what, 35 years, and um, it's. I think people are over it now. So um, it, it was just a matter of timing, and just a matter of getting him at the right moment where he, he said yes. I mean, but there are plenty of people that I asked who said no, uh, but you just don't hear about those. Can I hear a few names that said no? Oh, you name it. I mean, name some. Oh, Bill Murray. No. Okay, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, John Schwartzwelder of the of the Simpsons. He's reclusive. You know, he's written thirty three episodes of the of the Simpsons, and he said no. He's never said yes. I mean, there's a lot of people I would love to get. Albert Brooks, no. Steve Martin, no. Tina Fey didn't want to do it. Um, so I now think less of all of those people. By the way, yeah, I wouldn't. Because, for you, Mike. For you. Uh, for me, yes, sure. For you. But to be fair to them, these interviews take up to twenty hours. Obviously, not at uh, the same 
same interview session, but it, they're very, very time, um, you know, they, they take a tremendous amount of time, and these people are very busy. So I think you know, it's understandable to me if they do say no, because this is not an interview for a blog. This is a Playboy-length, Paris Review-length interview that's very intensive. Yeah, I can see why they balk at it, but they're just so lovingly done, for lack of a better word. You are just incredibly thorough, and you obviously love comedy, and you're interviewing these people because you love their work. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I, but I think, quite frankly, most people didn't read the first book. This is the second volume. Maybe that'll change with the third book if there is one. I don't know. But they're just so packed. Their, their schedules are so packed, and if it's not an interview for Entertainment Weekly promoting a current movie, they look at it as not being essential publicity. Um, even though I think, and when I was growing up, the best type of pu- publicity for me were those interviews and books, like the Tom Shale Saturday Night Live book, where they really sat down, they really talked about their whole career and their philosophy and theories of comedy rather than just their latest movie. I mean, there's so many people, like, again, I considered myself very well versed in comedy, the history of it, and there's people that you talk about, uh, I'm thinking Peggy Lynch really leaps out at me. I had no idea who Peggy Lynch is, and now I'm dying to go and see if I can find any of these Ethel and Albert radio shows online just to listen to. You make the work these people do sound incredible. Like, it just baffles me. I, I get what you're saying. They They can only really cherry pick what they feel are the choicest interviews but they're lost dude i well thank but see that's an interesting example because here's someone who was 96 when i interviewed her she's now 97 and um still going somewhat strong but that was a case of her being happy that i got in touch with her and it was totally by accident i, I did not it's not like i knew about her and no one else did mm-hmm. i asked an expert on early comedy or radio comedy and early TV comedy, if any of the old comedy writers are still alive. And he said, I'm not sure. Uh, the list I have is a bit old. I went through it 10 to 15 years ago. You know, go down the list and see if anyone's still alive and capable of talking for hours and hours. So I went down the list, and the only one who was still alive, not just capable, but alive, was Peg Lynch. And she uh, answered the phone, and we ended up talking for an hour. So from that point, then I started doing research on her, and then I was I was just kind of shocked by the fact that she's really never been interviewed, and she was so um, really ahead of her time. I mean, she created. Some people feel she she invented the modern sitcom with a show called Ethel and Albert, which was first on radio, then on TV, which is a very realistic uh, style of comedy. It's 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 not um, Borscht Belt. It's not um, Three Stooges or uh, Abbott and Costello, it's very t- character-based and um, it, it's not like Seinfeld exactly. I mean, you, obviously you notice differences, but there's a lot of similarities and Jerry Seinfeld has actually said that he was influenced by this show. So that was just kind of like a lost treasure that was just total luck um, that it just fell in my lap. But she was happy because I do think she feels, and I think rightly so, does that She's been forgotten, and um, she may have been overlooked when it when it comes to comedy. No, I I I believe that's absolutely the case. I mean, the way you describe the show, it's it's visionary. Like you said, it shied away from the very, I I feel at least you know with fifty plus years perspective, very corny gags of the time, and it just sounded so just a, a humor based in reality. Right. I'd like to give you an example. Um, with uh, App and Costello, it would be all wordplay, and it would be the writers being funny, and maybe the creative characters of App and Costello, but it's very broad. We're now with um, Ethel and Albert. Um, a sample episode would be uh, Albert coming home from work during Halloween time around that season and wanting to scare Ethel, his wife. So he, before he comes into the house, he puts on the jack-o'-lantern that's sitting on the porch, and comes in and scares her, and she says, you know, get that thing off. I know who it is. It's you just being silly. And then he's unable to get it off, so they have to end up at the emergency room to have it surgically removed, <laughs> which I think is a great idea. It's very clever. Um, 
you know, there's another one is sort of similar in that he, uh, to be goofy, puts on his uh, Cub Scout uniform and uh, goes down to the kitchen and they're talking. And then he goes off to work and he took off the uniform but forgot he was wearing his Boy Scout hat So that he had from when he was a kid. So it's just things like that that are very um, situational based and very uh, connected with character rather than uh, cleverness that I thought was uh, really ahead of his time. Is You've mentioned character a couple times, and I, I feel shows a lot of times skip on that, and I don't think that's unique to these times. You're not finding a lot of, like, Larry Sanders shows being produced, period. Is that what first spoke to you when you got into comedy? Like, what is it that first drew you into comedy? What was the first comedic product where you're like, oh, my God, I'm in love with this as an art form, period? Yeah, it was all character-based. I mean, the best comedy, in my opinion, are character-based, whether it's Charlie Chaplin or Woody Allen or Albert Brooks or Steve Martin's character, or the characters they did on SNL, which I loved, or the characters that Chris Elliott would play on Late Night with David Letterman I was obsessed with. And to me, that those that's always funnier when you have a, a fully rounded character coming from an imaginary world that I can uh, think about. I mean, when, when it's connected to character, I think the jokes are stronger. Um, a lot of the freestanding jokes are funny, but they're just clever. Uh, but when when there's humanity involved in it and there's in this real life, to me the comedy becomes deeper, and that's the kind of comedy that I really like. I mean, I like monologue jokes too. And I'm fascinated by writers of that. But to me, what's really interesting is the comedy that is character based, and that's really the comedy that lasts. You know, gags written 2,000 years ago by Aristophanes aren't funny now, but his plays about real people. And they're really not, obviously, not much different than us. Still, are funny to me because it has to do with relationships and striving and ego and uh, not achieving your dreams and all that. So that, to me, remains really fresh. Now we were talking before we recorded about DC humor, and I was never a fan of Art Buckwald, who had a syndicated column, um, because what what happened? I, I would I was a huge fan of comedy. I would walk through the Davis Library in Rockville and look for in the comedy section and looking at the Art Buckwell compilations when he would do columns from Watergate it, it, you, you might as well have been looking at something from a thousand years ago it was just so dated and so it didn't connect at all but I would look at these plays written a thousand years ago and it was all character based and it was fresher than what uh, Art Buckwell had done just ten years previous so that's I, I want was. to see that on one of his book jackets <laughs> well <laughs> He's passed away, so there'll be no Damn more book it. jackets. But I mean, he he was he was talented. It just didn't appeal to me, and it was always um, the character-based stuff that lasted for me, and that still interests me. It's it's funny you mention DC comedy in general. I I spend a large portion of the show bitching about how I feel there really is no comedy scene here, and you're kind of left sitting here looking up at New York, looking west. For you know, to L.A., even Chicago seems better. I mean, what is there anything you like out of the D.C. comedy scene, or is it the wasteland that I pretty much portray it to be? And if so, haha, I told you also. Well, yeah, I mean, when I was growing up, I always looked to New York and L.A. Um, and Chicago and Toronto. Um, and, and the D.C. comedy I hated. I didn't like Capital Steps, um, which are a musical parody Ugh, just, um, just... government. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or Mark Russell, or any of that stuff. But you look at who has emerged out of D.C. and uh, Patton Oswalt. He Patton Oswalt worked at Waxy Maxies in Northern Virginia. That was another failed record store, as I recall, right? <laughs> well, it was around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it died um, with the MP3, I guess. I think, yeah, it definitely doesn't exist. I mean, and, yeah. that, and that was actually it just sort of imploded. I worked at Kent Mill, and that imploded uh, by the time. Was the there a rivalry there? Well, that's how I actually I got the interview with Patton Oswalt. I wrote jokingly that I worked at Kent Mill. He worked at Waxy Maxies. We used to be enemies, but can we bridge our differences and talk about comedy? He was very, very nice and uh, funny, and he said, yeah, he he said yes to an interview. But for someone like that to emerge out of D.C., I find even fa you know just fascinating. Um, but you know, there was quite a group in the '90s. Dave Chappelle did a lot of performing in D.C., um, but there's no. It's just a company town, and the and the business is politics, you know. 
Yeah, yeah so. it, it seems a good place to be from in comedy, but not to Yeah, remain. no, not to remain. So the question is, why do you remain? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, God. I I remain for what I perceive to be lack of opportunities. Radio is a cruel, cruel mistress. And lately, again, really since that FCC incident, which was, Christ, 10 years ago at this point, it uh, radio has been gutted. And you so think, mobility yeah. has has really been stripped from the area. You kind of just, whatever station pick you up, you try to work your way through those ranks. But honestly, for me, I, I, I don't know. I have a business here, but I'm getting sick of that too. So What's the business? <laughs> uh, I run a locksmith company. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, I don't know if you have to leave um, anywhere. You, you can achieve what you need to achieve anywhere. So I, I wouldn't feel bad. The reason I ask that is that like, I feel... Yeah, I miss DC, and I did have to come to New York to work in in magazines. But in a lot of ways, I think being where you're from and and doing comedy from where you're from is better because I I think you know the area better, and it's more personable, and you don't necessarily have to be, you know, in New York living in an 800 square foot apartment to to put out the type of material that you want to put out now. Damn it, I need you to romanticize New York a little more. It is, it's what I will I, not do that. Uh, son of a bitch. It's a jungle, baby. <laughs> well, D.C. is a traffic-laden hellhole now, so it's it all is. bad. But so is everywhere. I mean, at least it's, you know, it's a pleasant place to live down there. I really kind of miss it. Well, are, are you ever swinging by? I mean, you can certainly drop in the studio. I would love that, actually. I'm coming down, I think, next month. Nice. I will be holding you to that. I will actually be up in New York tomorrow. To, oh, I'm uh, gone. I won't be here. <laughs> well, why are you coming up? This is going to sound awful. My girlfriend is obsessed with Lena Dunham. Oh, uh, that does sound awful. Yeah, she is speaking at, I believe, a Brooklyn bookstore. Really? And, yeah, I want to say the tickets were 270 for the pair, and so we will be making a day trip. Two hundred seventy dollars. Yeah, yeah. For fucking. Oh, sorry. For an <laughs> book author. That's insane. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh my God. All right. Well, God bless. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the condolences. Yeah, yeah. I want to get back to poking a dead frog for a bit. Uh, the book contains, in addition to what I've said before, these insanely, just perfect interviews they somehow always seem to wind up exactly where they need to i am incredibly jealous of your technique but there's uh it, it's a rotation of segments there's also ultra specific comedic knowledge right which uh this will shock you but you get ultra specific comedic knowledge for example todd levin of conan tells the reader how to write a submission packet for late night and again, going back to Pat and Oswalt, you have another segment called Pure Hardcore Advice. Right. And in a lot of ways, I feel the book reads like a how-to for a lot of people who might not otherwise know how to get into comedy. Like, at least giving them hints, giving them tidbits, which I feel are very hard mm -hmm. to pick up for a lot of people. I mean, was that like a very conscious thing when you oh, yeah. did the book? Uh, okay. But that's one of the things, too, like I grew up in Virginia and Maryland and uh, comedy writing, show business, writing for magazines, books. It was very, very foreign to me. I didn't know anyone who did it. Didn't know anyone who knew anyone who did it. Um, so I never, I didn't know how to do it. It was very mysterious. It was a different world. And it's not something I was ever taught in high school or college. You know, the writing teachers in college usually have some experience, but it's not with comedy writing. And even publishing it, it's usually with smaller literary magazines than it is with big uh, magazines and books, book publishing. So I don't think it needs to be mysterious. There is a way to do it. There are things you should do and you should, and things you should not do, which is just as important, if not more important, because when you do certain things, it keys off the person on the other end. Sometimes it shows them that you're an amateur if you do certain things. So I did want it to be very nuts and bolts. It's like, all right, well, how did you achieve success? How did you do it? And what would you do again uh, differently if you had to do it again? And I thought going straight to those who have achieved success was the best way. And there's, there's a lot of books written by people, a lot of comedy books, who maybe have written one sitcom episode or have done a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But I don't know why they have to be between us, the reader, and the 
successful comedians and comedy writers. I, I saw no reason why not to go straight to the source and get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So, and that was the main reason. And really, the perfect reader for me is someone walking in Davis Library who wants to get into comedy and just has no idea how to do it and stumbles upon this book. And um, it, it it speaks to them in a certain way. I I don't know if you want to, but can you actually share your journey into all this in terms of, like, what did you do? Because I, I agree 100%. It's incredibly arcane, like, finding out for a lot of people how to break into this world. And, again, if you want to, get the book. Get it now. I'm going to post multiple links to it on the site and tweet about it and everything. But for you, what exactly – because you – you said, I think, what anyone who has any comedic aspirations feels, oh, my God, I have zero idea how to get here. So what was it for you? Like, what was step one, two, three? Yeah, well, I think that's um, changing now. I think people are, you know, it's less mysterious than it used to be, which is a good thing. But when I was growing up, um, there were very few outlets. You know, cable wasn't huge. There was a few you know, popular comedies, late night shows and that. But it was, um, you know, it was like something on the moon. I just had no idea how to get from point A to point B. So what I did was I just, you know, fumbled my way through it. I didn't know what to do. So after I graduated college, I was living in New Orleans where I went to college, and then I moved back to D.C. area, and I ended up working back at Campbell Records. I was going to ask. I worked there for a total of 10 years from 15 to 25 so it was not like I was on the fast track to anything. I just didn't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I got my first job, which is a typical D.C. job, which was um, I was an editor for an association. That's very typical in D.C. Uh, for writers and editors. They edit association publications. And this one was uh, very dry, very boring, but it, it gave me a little bit of editing experience. And from there, I did night editing and weekend editing at a wire service called Knight Ritter, which is downtown. And then I was uh, temping at the Washington Post, typing in their ads, uh, literally typing them in. And um, I snuck into the employment office, which you weren't supposed to do as a temp, and saw that they were hiring an editor for the syndicate, which syndicated George Will, Jane Bryan Quinn, all those uh, columnists, Richard Cohen, Tom Shales. And ju- they were looking, I saw on the on the uh, sheet, for a, an ancient word processing program called Xyrite, which is pre-Microsoft Word. And I just happened to have known that, having done that at Night Ritter. <laughs> Sounds like a virus. Yeah. Well, it basically was. But because of that, I was the, really, I'm not being modest, it was the only reason I got the job is I knew Xyrite. Mm-hmm. And from, so I became a Washington Post uh, editorial and working editorial. See, but that's a good lesson. And that's what I, I, I learned from that is that, when you open yourself up to possibilities, work as hard as you can, do as much as you can. Like I was, I was doing nights and weekends while having another job, but because I did that, I learned a program that got me into the Washington Post, which then got me into Vanity Fair. So one thing does lead to another, and you have to be very open to experiences, and um, you have to experience as much as possible. There's nothing to be gained from being kind of reclusive, which I was for a long time, too. You know, you don't meet people, you don't open yourself up to experiences. So from a professional standpoint or from a writing standpoint, nothing can really be gained. So I moved up to New York, worked at Vanity Fair, and from there started freelancing for other magazines and uh, books. I, that's incredible to me. Well, it I mean, it's just, you know, everyone says this, and it's, it's luck, but there are things that you put yourself into positions um, where you can find luck. And one of those things I would do a lot earlier, I would surround myself with like-minded people. I wouldn't view it as being a competition because in the end, it's really who you know, and you really should come up together rather than competing because there's not much to compete for. It's not that much money. But the person that you may have hung around with as an intern at a magazine you know, five years later, they may be the head of the magazine. So those are the people of your generation that you come up with, and I would um, – it's it's just a sense of community. You just meet as many like-minded people as possible, and that can only help your writing, and it can only help your career. Hmm. This is a random question. I, you're just a funny as hell dude. Did you ever have an urge to do stand-up? Like, did you feel 
hey, I'm funny, I kind of have to do this as a, a rite of passage, or did you come from a place where you're like, I can be funny, it doesn't require the stage, I will simply write? No, I never um, ever had that uh, had that hunger. Um, I have done some performing a little bit since then, but um, like book I, readings it, where you charge three hundred dollars for a pair of tickets. <laughs> God damn it! That's outrageous. I, know. I don't know. Why. I know. Okay, I won't even get into that. But um, I just find that crazy. Mm-hmm. Me too. Uh, don't worry. Me too. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've I've done a lot of readings now, and things. I don't really like doing it. I, I prefer being behind the scenes. I prefer the control of writing. Um, but you know, for something like this, just talking, I love a podcast and being interviewed on stage or whatever. Yes, I love. But the, I, I could do without the performing. That doesn't. To me, the writing is the performing from my standpoint. <laughs> I I'm gonna let you go in a minute. I God damn, I could drone on with you all day, dude. Drone, I, baby. I, I have quite the man crush here. I I first just want to praise you. The title of the book is, I believe, a E.B. White quote that you have in the introduction. And it reads, Humor can be dissected as a frog can, but the thing dies in the process, and the innards are discouraging to any but the pure scientific mind. Humor won't stand much poking. It has a certain fragility and evasiveness, which one at best respect. I love the you titled the book pretty much saying what I'm doing in this cannot be done. The the entire concept is you really can't probe humor and get away with it. What the hell? I'm going to do it for like 500 pages anyhow. Well, no, but that's the thing. I, I don't really agree with that quote. I mean, I ah, think... Okay. Then you, I am a dunce. Continue. No, no, no. But you're right. I mean, uh, I think to poke at it, you're going to ruin the comedy. So I avoided trying to poke at it. I was being facetious. Like, here I am with a second volume, still poking that frog. I got you. But um, I do think it can be done. I don't. A lot of the times, in my opinion, it's done too academically. So that's one of the things I wanted to avoid. But I think coming at it and taking myself out of the equation where I'm not trying to top the comedy writers, which is sort of a pet peeve of mine, and I'm not trying to be funny, just allowing them to be smart and funny and just going straight to the source um, – Hopefully, I avoided the academic aspect of it, and hopefully, it can be helpful to those who are just either fans of it or who want to um, dedicate their careers to it. It's funny you mention that. I I feel it takes a lot of guts to simply. This is going to sound weird because you are interviewing the the best of the best in the comedic world, but I still think a lot of people would try to get these jokes in there whenever they could, and I love the fact that you sit back, let these people talk, and just once in a while you get a little something in that gives insight into the fact you're funny as hell. And <laughs> well, Yeah, thanks. Well, that's a pet peeve. I mean, I see that all the time when someone interviews a comedy writer, and usually and inevitably the interviewer is a comedy writer wannabe, so they'll try to outdo the... Yes, yeah, um, their chance to shine. Right, and I, you know, in fact, I always edit out every everything that might be construed as me trying to be funny every once in a while maybe once every two or three interviews i might just leave something in because it it would wreck the flow if i if i brought it out but i do not want to be the center of attention i, I don't you know it's there they're in the spotlight not me and i think and hope that um you know like those great johnny carson interviews where johnny carson would look great by holding back and letting his guests be funny, I just allow these writers to to really shine. And that actually is, I'm going to stick up for you a little bit here. Speaking of pet peeves with people trying to be funny when they shouldn't, et cetera, et cetera, I feel everyone who gave you a quote, and God bless them, they did you a huge service. But I, I am very, very just straight, straight up gay for Bob Odenkirk, oh, and the he's fact the best. that I, I feel. Him. Every other guy, and I'm not going to mention any names whatsoever except Bob's, I feel almost everyone else tried to give this quippy little recommendation, you know, and bits of praise for the book that are all over the jacket. And again, they're awesome for doing it. But Bob just came out and said, no one generates more interesting, revealing, or entertaining interviews than Mike Sachs. Poking a dead frog is a classic. And again, there's just something so ballsy about a dude who's funny as hell, and he's like, I don't have to be funny all the time. Yeah, I know. Well, this that's is, Bob Odenkirk. Yeah. He's amazing. This is Mike's time. 
Yeah, well, the thing is, too, a lot of those people who gave me blurbs didn't even read the book. So that's their that's their way of saying, uh, okay, I'll give the publisher a blurb, but I don't even know how good it is. So I'll be a little quippy. But Bob read the book, so he he, he felt he could be um, – he could be, I guess, honest. But that's just who he is, too. And that comes out in his comedy, which is so brilliant, is that he doesn't give a shit if it comes off as earnest or as character-based or any of that. He just does what he wants to do. He's just a real individual. No, and I love the fact that he gave that quote. It just meant a lot to me. He's incredible. When I was uh, younger, I was obsessed with Mr. Show, and I was oh, yeah. totally on Dave Cross's jock out of the two. And as time goes on every day, I'm just like, what the hell was I thinking? Clearly, Bob was the man here. Yeah, I know. Well, he is a comedic genius, and everything he's been associated with, even by proxy, even the shows like Tim and Eric or the Birthday Boys or any of that, like that's him bringing those shows to light. And that's not to say anything against David Cross, who's an amazing stand-up. But um, Bob Odenkirk is almost like a uh, student of comedy. He knows everything about comedy, and he's also incredibly open to uh, new comedy. So he's not shutting himself in his room watching old Mr. Show DVDs. He's really out there and uh, finding stuff that he really loves and then being a mensch and, and talking up these people and giving them shots, which is very, very rare. Um, it doesn't happen too often, but he's just a really special guy. He is. I And, God, I am, I am so in love with the fact that he's finally getting his due with Better Call Saul. Like, I am oh, praying God, that yeah. thing does ten seasons. I want it to be the Frasier to Breaking Bad's Cheers. Like I, I don't know. My feeling is it's going to be amazing. That's just my feeling, what he's said so far. And from what I've heard about the show, I think it's going to be a combination of funny and, and horrific and just amazing. And I'm really excited. I think it comes out in February. And I, I watch very, very little TV at this point, but like this is a show I cannot wait to see. I think he's going to be fantastic. It's. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Before I let you go, I actually did want to ask, like, what are you currently ob I, obsessed with? I don't know, it's kind of a exaggerated word for it, but what are you loving comedically? Like, well, one of the. I mean, I love, um, you know, uh, Breaking Bad. I thought that was a combination of comedy and horror, which I've never quite seen before. The Sopranos I found funny too, but I actually prefer Breaking Bad to The Sopranos. Um, one of the things I love is a show that was on the radio called The Best Show on FMU. Okay. And it was uh, with Tom Sharpling, who was the host. It would be a three-hour weekly show, and two hours of that would be uh, music and calls and things of that sort. And uh, usually, not every week, but most weeks, he would have these uh, calls with a performer, John Worcester, who's a comedic performer. He's also the drummer for uh, Bob Mould and the Mountain Goats and um, some other bands. So he's an amazing musician, an amazing performer, and they would do these characters uh, week after week over a series of like 10, 15 years where they would create an entire world called Newbridge, New Jersey, and just really getting in-depth about that world, about the characters, about their backstories, and it's the most astonishing thing. Now, he's no longer on WFMU, Tom Sharpling, but he's about to begin his own podcast. But every one of his shows is on the WFMU website. So you can literally listen to 15 years of shows, uh, comedy shows that, that these guys have done. And I just think it's astonishing. And he says WFMU's website? Yeah, WFMU.org. Okay. I will have to give that a look-see. Yeah, check it out. Mike, I feel I should let you go at this point. No, it was fun. I love talking with people from my home turf <laughs> if you can come really in studio, do dude i i had a, an incredible time if you want to come in studio anytime if how bad how bad is the traffic around the studio is it right off the uh it's that, about i want to say two miles outside of the beltway mm -hmm. uh there's times where it's light i don't know i yeah. I, I, can, I can give you the little windows you could sneak in here <laughs> yeah I, I think I know them unless, unless they've closed since I've been down there. I mean, I always used to, if I could, travel between like 10 and 3, and then after that, the Pentagon would get out, and that would yes. muck up. Yeah. It is, it's been shaved down to about 11 to 2 at this point. Oh, my God. Wow. Yes. So that's my window. All right, I'll come down from New York, and I'll, I'll, I'll land between 11 and 2, <laughs> and we can figure something out. I would love that. People, please buy this book. Again, I'm going to put the link out wherever I can. Poking a dead frog. Conversations with today's top comedy writers. 
If you want to follow Mike on Twitter, it's at Michael B. Sachs, and the website is MikeSachs.com. Oh, and one last thing. I love the fact that you are using the image of John Hamm yeah. wherever possible. <laughs> In the about the author, it is just John Hamm at the typewriter and very dryly yeah. at the end <laughs> talking about Mike Sachs. He is not pictured here. Right. Well, I should explain. I didn't want to be photographed. I'm not going to sell one book through my face, but I figured if I could get someone famous to play the character of a comedy writer, a frustrated comedy writer, it might be able to sell more. And luckily, John Hamm is a um, big fan of comedy, and he posed for hours for free one weekend uh, for a friend of mine who's a photographer, and I just thought it was so nice. But the the photo author photo in my book is John Hamm as a uh, frustrated comedy writer. Your and Twitter I, photo as well, by the way. Oh, I use it on my driver's license. I'll use it <laughs> anywhere. You know, think John Hamm trying to look bad is 100% better than me, all gussy. Oh, he's still, my, he's still he's, glorious. He's a fantastic, he's a great-looking guy and a great person. So like any in any way, I, I'm sure he wouldn't even be happy with me doing this, but like I'm posting his photo on all my sites, Facebook, Twitter, you know, wherever my, I need to put my own face, John John Hams goes up. But well, I, I, he can't blame me for that, quite <laughs> frankly, right? The worst thing is on Twitter, it took me forever to give it your picture more than a passing glance. But whenever I would at first, I'm like, that handsome bastard. Yeah, what a, <laughs> what a handsome dude. Why is he doing writing? Exactly. Yeah, meanwhile, yeah. I look, you know, you should see what I look like in reality. So the <laughs> fact that John Hamm is my public face is the best. <laughs> oh, God. You're killing me, dude. All right, Mike, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I guess I'll stop the recording here and then, you know, give you a little blowy. When All right, man. Die. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, I'll talk with you soon. All right, man. Mike, thanks again. No problem. Take care. All right. Once again, a, a huge thank you to Mike Sachs for taking the time to come on the show Please do yourself a favor. I'm not just doing this because the guy's really, really nice and down to earth. His book, Poking a Dead Frog, Conversations with Today's Top Comedy Writers. If you're at all into comedy, if you fancy yourself a student of comedy, any of that stuff, it's just an incredible read with names that you're familiar with, names that you didn't know, but the instant you read about them, you're like, God damn it, I have to get on knowing that. Please, again, Poking a Dead Frog it can be found Amazon, you know, Kindle editions, all that good stuff. Just get it, get it quickly. If you want to get a hold of Mike on Twitter, it's at Michael B. Sachs, and his website is MikeSachs.com. I'm John Papa Giorgio of Papa's Basement. That's all we have time for this episode. You want to get a hold of me for whatever reason, trust me, get a hold of Mike instead of me. He's much, much funnier and better in all ways as a human being as well as a comedic talent. But if you still want to slum it up, I am over at inpapasbasement.com. It's at Papa's Basement on Twitter. And find the show Papa's Basement on iTunes and Stitcher as well as Papa's Football Podcast. And if you're into the comic thing at all, you can go to thespookiescomic.com. I write that as well. All right. Uh, again, Mike, thanks. All right. We're out of here. We're home free. School's out, baby. Good show. Nothing to talk about, nothing to critique. Great show, great guest tomorrow. You go home, have a glass of wine, whack off. I'll see you tomorrow. That's the post-show critique? Yeah. You're the best. It's my time to go. I successfully burned all my bridges. Nobody loves me and I don't love nobody. <laughs> then he said penis. <laughs> yeah. Then he said masturbation. <laughs> then he said vagina. <laughs> that was cool. I had a mighty hard time, but I'm on my way. I had a mighty hard time, but I'm on my way. It's a mighty hard climb, but I'm on my way.